Welcome to a Greenville County Library System virtual event. My name is Rachel and I'm the Adult Outreach and Event Coordinator for the library. I'm so pleased you could join us for this event, Indoor Herb Gardening Upcycled Planter, presented by Greenville County Soil and Water Conservation District. If you're interested in our other virtual events and activities, please check out our website, greenvillelibrary.org, and select Adult Virtual Events under Classes and Events button. That way you can see our live virtual events calendar. If you're interested in checking out gardening and sustainability materials in the meantime, make sure that your library card is up to date and come visit us at any of our locations. We always look forward to serving you. Please join me in welcoming our presenter for today, Shanine with the Greenville County Soil and Water Conservation District. Take it away, Shanine. Hello everyone and thank you, Rachel. That was such a lovely introduction. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started for tonight. First things first, if you are able to use your video this evening, please do so. It's easier for me to see what y'all are up to and help troubleshoot any challenges that may come up as we go through tonight. Um, Again, my name is Shanine. I work with the Soil and Water Conservation District of Greenville County, and I am a community relations coordinator. So I teach on stormwater management, and we do a lot with local agriculture as well. I'm an avid gardener, um, and this is really fun for me. So we're going to go ahead. There we go. So let's set up our virtual learning space. If you can go ahead and rename yourself, you'll go to the three dots above your video or your black little screen. Click that and then you'll rename yourself with your first name, last initial and your pronouns. Um, again, only if you're able, it's not too big of a deal um, if you're not able or do not wish to. Keep yourself muted throughout. At the end, we will have some time for questions. And if you do have some, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask. I love to hear your voices as well. Um, and as we go throughout, please type any questions in the chat box. Rachel will help moderate and um, we'll get those answered as we go through the presentation. So don't hesitate, don't hold your questions, just type them in there. Um, I hope you all have gathered your materials. The list is in the chat, it's also on that. Um, guide that you could download. And if you would like, go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat as well, just so we get an idea of who is on with us. Or maybe introduce yourself and where you're listening from. As you do that, I'll keep going here. I already introduced myself. I'm Shanine. Rachel has introduced herself um, and she is our moderator for this evening. She also is the one that makes these events possible and coordinates everything. So we're very grateful to her. Um, this class and the Seed Library in general are supported by Duke Energy and in collaboration with us and the County Library System. So we're also very grateful for that. If you ever want to check out Seeds, the Berea branch hosts our seed library and you're able to check out five packets at a time per library card holder. Um, so be sure to check that out. All of the resources for the seed library can be found on the seed library page of the website, of the library's website. All right. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get starting. We're gonna cover a lot tonight. We're gonna to talk about upcycling and recycling and planting and herbs and all things that I'm very passionate about and really excited to share with y'all tonight. First things first, upcycling. We talk a lot about reduce, reuse, recycle, and I think everybody's very familiar with those three R's and that whole concept, but upcycling is a relatively new term that was kind of brought into circulation in the early uh, 1990s. And the whole idea is that we're talking about giving old products more value, not less. So we think about recycling and we think that that material will be used for something else, but we don't necessarily think that's going to be an upgrade. Maybe it's a downcycling and it's being like reused for a different kind of bottle or plastic or whatever it is. It really depends on what you're recycling, right? Um, but upcycling has many different applications. There are some commercial, but a lot of it can be creative too. And I think that is my favorite part of this. We can take broken coffee pots, we can take recycled bottles like we're doing tonight and create something that's not only useful 
um, but also beautiful in, in its own special way. Um, and the possibilities are absolutely endless. There is no right or wrong way to upcycle. If you think it's great, then it probably is. Um, it also reduces what goes into the landfill. Um, recycling is obviously great and that's reducing what goes into landfills as well. But as we all know, it's easy to do recycling a little bit incorrectly and then all of those things end up in the landfill. So this is a really, really easy way, I think, for most things to kind of keep them out of that whole system, uh, which is awesome, at least for another iteration of its life. Um, we also can save resources with upcycling. Um, like tonight, we're gonna build a planter that otherwise we would have to go buy some little plastic pot or a little something like that, especially dollars, but we're also saving water resources, the water resources that it would be Need, be needed to create something new. Um, we're saving time resources in a lot of cases. And we're also just like, I think the creativity side of it is kind of saving our health as well. It's giving us an opportunity to use our creative energy in a way that doesn't require us to break the bank or really do a lot outside of what we already have available at home. Um, and then just a fun little fact here, it takes 450 years for a plastic bottle to decompose in a landfill. Um, so every time you don't use a plastic bottle or can reuse a plastic bottle is an amazing thing in my opinion. All right, so that was just a little bit on upcycling. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about oregano too because I found some really interesting facts on it. So I intentionally chose oregano for this herb planter because of its versatility. Um, it's an amazing culinary herb used in everything from Latin cuisine to Italian cuisine to Greek cuisine. Um, so I think it's a really versatile thing. It smells very good like as it's growing, but also in dishes, it's subtle. Um, but it's actually originated in Greece uh, where it's thought to have started there and it's thought to, it, it's translated from Greece to joy of the mountain or brightness of the mountain, which I think is just really cool. Um, and it's actually in the mint family as well. If y'all have ever seen oregano growing out in the wild, um, it grows in a very similar pattern to mint. Um, slightly less invasive and a little bit easier to maintain control of than a lot of the mint that we see here, but in the same family, um, which means it is perennial. And we already mentioned cuisines. I wanna talk a little bit about ground cover as well. So part of what we do at the Soil and Water Conservation District is conserve soil. And oregano is one of those really great options if you have a bare spot in your lawn that you're really having trouble getting anything to grow in. Um, it deals well with poor soil. It's a great ground cover, it's low growing and it's useful to us animals like it, the flowers attract pollinators. So there's just a whole host of really great benefits to having oregano and it grows well indoors. There you go. Any questions from anyone before we kind of get into it? All right. So I wanna talk just really briefly about how our water, our self-watering planters work tonight. So I built one earlier, here we have it. Basically, it's a capillary action or a wicking system is the easier way to say that. So we have string that's acting as like our connector between the water and the soil. And that string will help maintain the moisture level in the soil. So just, it's basically like keeping everything at homeostasis. Everything has the same moisture level. Um, so as the roots of the plants that we have growing up here grow, they'll actually run into the string first and pull more water as they grow more, which I think is fascinating. Um, I found this to be an amazing option. I'm growing these in my office and I'm not here over the weekend. My plants haven't died yet, which is really great because uh, watering can be tricky. So I think it's a, one of the best options for like busy indoor gardeners. Um, I have links to like a really interesting little article on how to kind of make sure that you're using the right plants and things like that for self-watering planters because it maintains moisture in the soil. It won't work for succulents and some other things that need the soil to dry out in between waterings, but for herbs and for lettuce and spinach, this works really, really well. All right. 
So for tonight, we are going to make planters and plant oregano. And then I'll also give you some tips on troubleshooting towards the end of this. And we'll talk about um, a little surprise at the end and give you some tips on if you would like to transplant these outside in the spring. Okay. So I am assuming that everyone has their materials gathered. If you all could give like a little thumbs up or something like that, just to let me know that you're ready to get started here. That would be awesome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Great, and now is the time if you are able and willing to turn your video on because we're gonna do this together. And I'm gonna stop screen sharing so I can show you what we are doing. These are the materials. I think we've covered that. The thing that wasn't on that list was a marker or a pen and that's just so we write down what we planted and what day it is. Great, so let's go ahead and start. Um, we're gonna go ahead and prepare our bottle and I'm gonna show you and I can pull that screen up again. So grab your bottles. If you have the ones that were in some of the kits, great. If not, hey, we have the same one, Danielle, very nice. <laughs> so you're gonna go ahead and remove the label. And they have been cleaned, but they've also been sitting in storage for a while. So if you did have a chance to clean them before tonight, awesome. If not, they should be fine. Um, so remove that label. It's just easier. Mine is not wanting to come off very nicely tonight. So once you have that done, you're gonna go ahead and we're gonna cut in the middle of our bottles. What I've found to be the easiest way to make that happen is to actually poke a hole with either the point of your scissors or a knife, and then go ahead and cut all the way around. You wanna go, it's okay if the top is shorter than the bottom. So you probably wanna go a little over halfway up the bottle and do that. So go ahead and yeah, it if it's wrong, we can always you can always trim a little bit off the top or the bottom. If it's not quite right, that's okay. There is again, we're upcycling. There is no right or wrong. There's just creative opportunities. <laughs> What I would do is, yep, just cut in a circle around your bottle. Right. So if you all have your videos on and want to show me your halves, that's great. Yay. I'm so excited. Okay. None of the bottles that I gave out had caps. I don't know why, but if you do have a cap for your bottle and you're using one that you had at home, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead right now and poke a hole in it. A drill is the easiest way to do this with like a quarter inch or a, yeah, a quarter inch drill bit would work well. You could also use a hammer and a nail and put a board underneath your cap, go ahead and hammer your nail through the cap and then pull it out. Um, I think for the majority of us tonight, we don't have caps. So I'm going to go ahead and skip over that piece of this and we're going to move on to the next step. We're going to create wicks. So does everybody have the string that was provided in your kit? This is cotton, is unbleached cotton string because it absorbs things well and there are no dyes in it so it can't kind of harm our plants in any way. Um, if you can find organic cotton string, fantastic not the end of the world. You can also use an old t-shirt for this or just some kind of cloth that holds up well to water but also absorbs water. And then we're going to just fold it into four equal pieces, um, more or less equal, get close. And we also want to cut those pieces. What I found easiest in this step is to fold it, tie your knot 
first and then cut all the loops, if that makes any sort of sense. So you're gonna tie a knot about two inches up from one end and I just wrap it around my finger and pull all the ends through. Don't pull it too tight yet because we might have to adjust depending on the depth of your planter. And then I just take my scissors and cut all of those loops that we folded so they're all separate little wicks. And voila, we should have kind of four wicks on one side and four much shorter wicks on the other side. Awesome. If y'all want to give me a thumbs up when you got that step ready to go and we'll go ahead and keep going. Okay, great. Thank you, Jackie. I see that. So excited. While we kind of wait for everybody to get those wicks tied and cut, um, if you have a cap at this point, you're going to go ahead and thread your wick through that cap with the short end facing down. So this is how it would sit when the cap is attached to the, the top of the bottle. For those of us that don't have caps, which is, I would imagine, lots of us, we're going to take our wick and we're going to take the top of our bottle. And the short end, we want to fall through the, the cap or through the, the bottleneck, like so. And I'm just holding the top of it with my fingers. And then what I like to do at this step before I tape it into place is test and make sure all of those wick ends hit the bottom of my base. So for me, I tied mine a little short. So I, what I'm going to do is be lazy and just adjust it and shift it down just a little bit to make sure every end of my wick hits the water or hits where the water will be. So that's kind of what you want. I know it's hard to see through the bottle. Yeah, Kimberly, that looks great. Awesome. So once you have your wick sitting where you'd like it, go ahead and just take a small piece of tape and attach it to the side of your bottle. And I found it easiest to do it just right inside the bottleneck, but whatever works best for you, just somewhere towards the opening, somewhere near the opening. You want a very small piece of tape. Yeah, it looks great, looks great. Okay, once you have your wick in place and secured, we're gonna fill the top of our grow, our planter, essentially. This is our planter and this is our water. So the top of your bottle, I just like to set it into the base because it's easier, then I don't have to hold it. Grab your growing medium, whether you have that in a bag or whatever, you can use a spoon, you can use your hand, you can use a cup. And we're going to fill, we want to grab the ends of our wick, the long ends of our wick in one hand, and fill around it with the other hand. And you're going to go about two thirds of the way up the wick. And because we don't have caps, some soil will fall through into the base. That's all right. We'll take care of that in a minute. Okay, so once I have my wick ends still kind of showing through, 
I want to go ahead and I want to pull those kind of in four different directions and try to distribute them relatively evenly in the growing medium. And a note on the growing medium that we're using, it's a potting soil. It's a potting soil mix that has coconut core and perlite and some just, you know, regular soil. Um, I got it at Lotus. That's not necessary. Any potting soil mix will do. Um, but what is really important for self-watering planters is that you have something like coconut core or perlite and vermiculite that's light and will absorb and hold water very well. So, and that's why we're using a potting soil mix and not just a garden soil, because that will tend to compact and it will be more difficult for this system to function well. Also for root growth and all of that, especially in, there's a reason it's potting soil. It's because it doesn't have all of the same microbes and little like life living in it um, to help kind of keep aeration and movement. So we want to make sure we're using some kind of potting soil mix in any indoor planter. All right, so once you have your wicks distributed, go ahead and finish filling and leave just a little bit on the top, like a quarter inch or less of space between the top of your growing medium and the top of your planter. So what I like to do, I just kind of shake mine down to level it off. You can also use your finger and just kind of level, make sure the top of your, your growing medium is relatively level and that'll make sure that your seeds are evenly distributed and things of that nature. And go ahead and give me a thumbs up when you're ready for the next step. That looks pretty good. Danielle, if you have a little bit more growing medium, I, you could put some more in there and quantities might not be perfect. I apologize for that. Made my best guess. <laughs> the other thing that I love about a potting soil mix with coconut core is that coconut core is a more sustainable source of um, a soil conditioner than peat um, because peat is pulled out of bogs and it takes thousands of, and thousands of years for that material to kind of grow into what it is. Coconut core, if you've ever seen a full coconut, is just like that really horrible rough husk that's around the actual coconut. And it's like three times as thick as the coconut itself. And it's a renewable resource. Okay, so at this point, if you have it available, it would be beneficial for, well, first, before we do anything, go ahead and take your top, take your planter out of your base, and dump any of any of the growing medium that fell in there. Go ahead and dump it back into your bag or back into the top of your planter. Awesome. And this step is not included in the guide, but it is helpful just to get your seeds, give your seeds a good start. If you have a spray bottle or have a way to kind of put a gentle stream of water, yes, Danielle, so prepared. Um, <laughs> Go ahead and mist the top of your growing medium really well and go ahead and try to like get that, that soil a little bit moist um, or damp. I'm going to grab my spray bottle as well. And what this just does is it helps give like, so this whole idea of wicking, it helps give the medium a place, a good place to start too. So the string isn't absorbing like all of your water all at once. It'll have a baseline to kind of work with. Um, so yeah, spray bottle would be great, but also like I have a pitcher of water here. If you can be gentle, more or less, you can go ahead and just dump that on there too. Okay. So we'll go ahead now and put some water in our base before we plant our seeds. Um, so what you want to do, again, pull your planter out of your base and grab some water. 
and go ahead and put about half an inch of water in the bottom of your planter or in your base. What we want here is enough water that all of our wick ends are submerged, but not so much that the top of our bottle or our cap is in the water. So put them in there, test it. I have a bunch of space between my cap and my, and my water, so I'm gonna add some more. It's too much if it hits the cap, but it's not, I mean, you can fill it right to that line. Okay, and then I can get thumbs up when y'all are ready to go. We'll do planting next. Okay, so next up, we're gonna plant our oregano. Open up those seed packets and know that these seeds are really tiny, like very, very, very tiny. So be careful. <laughs> um, you won't feel them. And this is what we're planting today. It'll grow to about two feet tall at the maximum, but if you're harvesting it regularly, it won't ever get that tall. And outside oregano of this variety can get 18 to 24 inches wide as well. So it can cover a lot of ground. Um, so you take your seeds in your packet and you're going to very gently try to distribute them pretty evenly on top of your growing medium. All of them? I mean, if you can separate out like four or five, that would be great. Don't worry about it though, because what we can also do is transplant. Really, the space that this planter has is good for about one oregano plant to grow very well, but because of germination rates and the seed size and all of that, it's easier. If we were sowing these outside, we would do what we call broadcast seed. And that's just kind of toss them out and hope for the best. And when they get big enough, when they have a one or two set of true leaves, um, you can transplant and move them around or thin them out. Um, and you can do that with your indoor planters as well. All right, so if we have all of those planted, we're gonna go ahead and you can, if you have a tiny bit of growing medium left, if you don't know worries, either with like two fingers, kind of gently tamp the top of your soil, which is just like gently pat to make sure that there's good seed and soil contact. And if you do have a little bit of growing medium, it won't hurt to sprinkle that just a really thin layer over those seeds. Again, just to ensure that you have some good soil and seed contact. If you have a mister, now would be the time to use that. If you don't, don't water on top of them. You'll displace them a lot. <laughs> um, but go ahead and mist over those little tiny seeds. And you've planted oregano. The other option here is if you have a damp paper towel or an old t-shirt, something like that, you could cover the top of this for about until they germinate, it could be anywhere from seven to 14 days, kind of depending on light and warmth and all of that. That will just help ensure that they are staying, the seeds themselves are staying damp. What you will want to think about in just until the seeds germinate and get a good start is keeping the top of your planter a little bit damp. So either misting or like taking your fingers and flicking some water on there just to make sure that they again are staying damp because to germinate seeds need heat and water. Um, and then when they germinate, they need light. Okay, so that y'all, you have planted oregano and made a planter. Um, great job, thank you so much. The other thing you could do right now is take your marker and just write what you planted and today's date that I find that, but really helpful because I'll forget what I planted sometimes. Um, so today I'm just going to write oregano and the date. 
which is the 14th of December. I think it would be really fun if you have like kids or grandkids and would want to like decorate the bottle before you planted it or something like that. You can paint these on the outside. Obviously, you don't want to do that on the inside. Um, there's so many options and opportunities with that side of it to make them a little prettier, a little more creative. All right, I'm going to share my presentation again. And we'll go ahead and just kind of run through the last couple steps here. Pre-germination care. So we've already mentioned a little bit about that, but you're gonna to wanna to put these planters in a safe and sunny location. You wanna kind of avoid any major disturbances. So pets or, you know, interested fingers and things like that. It's fine once the plants get established, but these little guys won't do so well if they're knocked around before they germinate. Um, and you want eight or more hours of sun a day is ideal. A south facing windowsill is perfect for this. Um, don't worry if it's a little bit less than that, your plants will just grow slower. Um, also keep in mind that they do like to be at 65 degrees or warmer. So if your windowsill does get cooler at night, it's okay to kind of pull them in or have them sitting on a table a little bit more inside the house. Um, and then we mentioned to try to keep the seeds damp before they germinate. Um, that'll just help speed up that process. Okay post-germination care. So these seeds will germinate anywhere from seven to 14 days, depending on how happy they are. Um, and you're gonna to wanna to refill the water as needed. So what I've been finding so far with my basil planter over here is every like three to four days, I put some more water in there. You don't wanna let the planter dry out um, or like the bottom be totally devoid of water. So just check it every so often. As the plants grow, you'll have to water, you'll have to fill that more, but it shouldn't be more than every other day. That's the goal with something like this. And then you wanna make sure they stay in the sun throughout their growing cycle or life. Um, the more sun they get, the faster they grow, the healthier they'll be. Um, I don't know if anybody here has heard the word leggy before, the term leggy related to growing plants, especially vegetables, or when we talk about growing things indoors. Um, legginess is when a plant starts to like lean one way and grow really spindly, have a spindly stem and they start to lean really dramatically one way or another. It just means they're searching for the sun. So if you can find a place with more direct sunlight, if you do notice your oregano doing that, find a place with more direct sunlight or rotate that container 180 degrees every so often, like every other day or whenever you water it. And that'll help make sure that plant grows a little bit more straight. Okay, any questions so far? <laughs> All right, I've got a couple more slides then. We'll talk about harvest really quick. Um, so har first harvest, if the plants are growing happy and healthy, it will be in about 45 days at the earliest, probably closer to 60 with an indoor herb. Um, and you, wanna, you don't want to harvest before your plant is five inches tall, which is probably a better metric to use. Um, and never harvest more than one third of the total plant. That ensures that it can keep growing because oregano is perennial. We want to try to prolong its life as long as possible. Um, and the other important note about harvesting herbs in general is to try to harvest before flowering. So plants, generally speaking, put energy into leaf growth but once they start flowering, all of their energy is going into fruit production, which is a pepper or seeds or something like that. In herbs, it's seeds. Um, so the flavor in the leaves will diminish a lot once that herb starts flowering. Um, that being said, oregano flowers are lovely and also delicious. Um, so if you wanted to try to have oregano flowers as a garnish or something like that, totally fine too. Um, and then we go, we have leaf harvest. So pick individual leaves from the bottom of the plant, older growth, if you just want to grab some little leaves, 
I think this is the small leaf oregano, so maybe you'll want to harvest stems instead. Um, this is a great way to not only harvest, but also prune your plant back. So if you do end up with one of those like two foot tall, two foot wide oregano plants, um, great way to prune and kind of keep that under, under maintenance as well. Anytime you're pruning or harvesting anything, but herbs as well, especially perennial herbs, you want to make sure that you're using, using, excuse me, um, using a sharp pruning scissors or pruning tool and um, trim off the stems you wish to harvest. Again, no more than one third of the total plant at one time. All right, and then you'll wanna gently kind of clean and dry those leaves before you cook with them. I was talking to my father um, and I'm from Minnesota. So he brings his herbs into our garage um, over the winter. And he said the oregano is one of the only things that survived so far. Um, so it's a really great, like, hardy indoor plant, as well as, like, a, a plant that survives outdoors, even in Minnesota, which I found very interesting. All right, so there are very few things that should mess with your oregano, but these are some of the most common ones if you do come across some issues. Pests. This is going to be more common if you do have a plant outside but you're gonna get piercing or sucking insects. So that's aphids and mites and thrips, things that will kind of eat at the leaves. Um, and, but not like eat the leaves like a caterpillar would, but more like poke some kind of mouthpiece in there and pull nutrients from them. So you'll see like a yellowing of the leaves and then they'll slowly kind of like die off if it's a severe infection, but you're gonna notice the pest long before you notice that. Insecticidal soap has been my favorite way to do that and like really cost effective. So if you've ever heard of Dr. Bronner's Castile soap, um, you can use one teaspoon of that with one quart of warm water. Shake it up, let make sure it's well incorporated and go ahead and just in the evening, just coat everything that you want to try to kill. Um, and soft bodied insects will kind of just dissolve with the soap. It is generally safe um, if we're worried about like organic gardening or something like that, but aphids can multiply very quickly. Um, so important to kind of stay on top of that. Another option for a biological control with aphids that I'm aware of are lady beetles. If you really want to get fancy with that, we can talk offline. Let me know if you're interested. I have some resources. Diseases that are common in oregano are also common in mint. Um, so mint rust. And they're essentially they're pustules on the underside of the leaves. They won't look like that. It'll just kind of look like a weird discoloration under the leaves. Um, but it will yellow and then those leaves will slowly die off. Usually it's a problem with water splashback. So you want to just make sure you're watering at soil level. And in the, our case with these self-watering planters, you shouldn't have to worry about that at all. And then fungal root rot. Again, this is something that's way more common outdoors, but if your soil doesn't have enough drainage, the root itself will start to rot away. And it's a variety of different fungi that can cause that. Um, but your plant will kind of just generally be real unhappy and then slowly die off. The best thing you can do is plant in well-drained soil. If you're trying to plant in an area that you have clay or some really heavy soil, mix some sand in before you plant and that will help mitigate some of the issue. Okay, this is my bonus slide and this is the one I'm most excited about. Um, this is again, a really great ground cover. Ancient Greeks believed that cows that ate oregano had the best tasting meat as well. So what is this like? These prolific ground cover in like the hill, hilly countryside of Greece, apparently. Um, but anyway, the plants that we planted today should be ready to transplant outdoors when the weather warms up this spring, which is usually mid-March here. But to transition your house plants to outdoor plants, you want to go ahead and put them outside when the weather is above 65 degrees, kind of during the day. Um, and then bring them inside, especially if it's getting beneath 55 degrees overnight. And then do that for like a week or two. 
I never do that. I don't have the patience for it or I forget to bring them in and then they die. Um, so your safest, safest bet is to wait until it is 65 degrees or more overnight and go ahead and transplant them and they'll be okay. Um, so you're gonna wanna, again, pick a spot that gets full sun. Well-established oregano can handle partial sun as well, but it's gonna do best in full sun. Um, and make sure you have enough space for it. Again, we talked about how big the plants can get, right? Two feet tall, two feet wide. Um, yeah, and you go ahead, you dig a hole, put some compost or something in there to help give that plant a little bit of a boost in its transition period to the outdoors and use all of the soil from whatever planter you have, any plant that you're transplanting in. That will just help again, like ease that transition from indoor to outdoor for that plant. Kind of like a safety blanket for it. Um, and then you wanna go ahead, um, gently tamp the soil around it to help mitigate any chance of that washing away and exposing the root system and mulch over the exposed soil. That helps maintain the moisture in the soil. Um, so that plant doesn't dry out. Um, more to come on transplanting, maybe in the spring, if you do have questions or are interested in that, you can again, reach out to me at any time. I'm happy to help. Um, additional resources. These are some of the things that I found really helpful in my research for this. Um, the Epic Gardening article was fascinating. He has a really personable way of writing as well. So I would recommend that to anybody that is interested in herb gardening in general. Um, and then the, the steps that I put together were adapted from the super simple DIY self-watering herb garden blog post. So go ahead and if you would like some pictures of the process, she has some really great images on her blog post. And with that, that is all the information I have for this evening. What questions do you all have? We had someone in the chat uh, point out that if you do transplant them outside, honeybees love the flowers of oregano as well. Um, and, and joked that they didn't know what the, how the honey would taste from those bees, but, <laughs> but at least it would attract some pollinators. Yes. Thank you for mentioning that. I couldn't agree more. And maybe it could be a specialty honey, oregano honey. I mean, I have a question. If you yeah. plant them outdoors in the spring mm -hmm. and um, they're a perennial, do you cut them back in fall or do you have to bring them back in to the house and bring them back out? No, once they're well established outdoors, you definitely won't have to bring them in and out again. Um, they'll die back in the winter. You can prune them, especially if you want to kind of keep them at a more manageable size. I find it best. I have taken oregano almost all the way down in the fall and it comes back just as strong in the spring. So it's kind of, it's up to you. I think best practice would definitely be to prune it back. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for the questions. Anything else? So I knocked mine over. Is there oh, any saving no. it? <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. You know. <laughs> That's why I turned the video off. I was cleaning. <laughs> I was cleaning the keypad. Oh, did you did you ask if there's any way to save it? Is that what you said? Yeah, but there's probably not. If there's Those tiny the seeds, seeds, if they're too mixed up, they're not going to germinate through much more than a quarter inch. Um, I didn't think so. I'm so sorry. But if you are anywhere it. near Berea, I know we have oregano seeds in the seed library. Um, so fill that <laughs> back up and then grab some more seeds. Um, I'm so sorry that happened. Oh. But you could also plant any herb if you have herb seeds on hand. Basil, um, I found worked pretty well in these so far as well. So, okay. yeah, I'm so sorry. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> All right. 
Any more questions in the chat, Rachel? No, it looks like everyone's got their questions answered. A lot of people have said they're going to watch the recording again um, and maybe try some new seeds that they get from the seed library. So we yeah. do encourage that. Absolutely. Well, I want to say thank you all so much for your time. I appreciate you taking an hour out of your evening to spend with me. Again, reach out with any questions you may have. My contact information is here. Um, the experts with the seed library, which is kind of me too. Um, we're happy to help you out and utilize that seed library like Rachel mentioned. Okay, thank you so much, Janine. We really appreciate you. Um, I want to thank all of you too for joining us today for Indoor Herb Gardening. Uh, upcycled planter and I want you to stay tuned for our next gardening and sustainability live event uh, in the meantime check out our online calendar for other content or watch our on-demand on demand classes on our adult virtual activities page if you want to learn more about gardening and sustainability what you need to do is make sure that your library card is up to date your library card is your ticket to many free resources Databases, downloadables, streaming, TV, ebooks, audiobooks, music. Plus, you can always get more seeds for your planters by checking out the seed library at our Berea branch. If you need directions to the Berea branch, make sure you just go to our website, greenvillelibrary.org, and click on locations. That way they can direct you. And as always, we do recommend that you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter so that you get library updates and sign up for our e-newsletter so you don't miss out on events like this or some of these limited supply kits either. So thank you for your time and we look forward to seeing you soon. Come and join us.